for probably 25 years when I was just kind of a little arts and sciences journal, but I see these lasers are all over the place. And what a good idea. Thanks again. So anyway, uh, it's good that I'm starting because we are going back in time over five billion years in my talk and kind of uh, take evolution beyond the Earth back before there was an Earth to the early solar system and back before there was a solar system when our region of space looked like this. This is the uh, Orion Nebula. It's a uh, naked eye object. If you look just below the belt in those three stars in Orion, you'll see a little blur. The doctors, you see it nicely. And uh, the Orion Nebula is very close. And uh, to a non-astronomer, it's kind of mysterious, this cloud of stuff in the sky. Pretty amazing. And even the astronomers were amazed, though, when the Hubble telescope began to look closely at little areas like this. You can see these squares. And what did they see but a new star surrounded by dust? Those are all new solar systems. We have now counted some 1,200 or more, actually now, extrasolar planets out there, a few of which are Earth-like. They're sort of what we call the Goldilocks zone that'll let liquid water exist. And when you count that up for the entire galaxy, there's something like 60 billion planets like the Earth is what we've uh, recently heard. So it's pretty amazing. So what I'm going to be talking about, though, is leading up to life on our planet. So I'm going to not talk about the origin of life itself. It's pretty technical. I'm going to take you right up through the history of life, the evolutionary steps in solar system formation and so forth that allowed life to exist on the Earth. And it's really eye-opening if you don't know about it. I'm Dave Deemer at UC Santa Cruz, and this is LASER. Okay, let's uh, think a little bit more about this. So I said that's uh, dust, and that's why we see it. They're little tiny dust particles, mineral dust particles about the size of bacteria, a few microns across. And that is what we are made of. Carl Sagan said it best. He said, we are stardust, and that's the fact of the matter. This uh, sort of illustrates just what I said. Here's a beautiful image of Earth. And as you look around, you can see the stars up there. And in fact, the elements of life are made by nuclear fusion in stars. Uh, those elements are still being brought to the Earth. For instance, the northern lights, the aurora borealis, is protons and electrons from our sun being added to the Earth's atmosphere. That's what the aurora is really all about, it's just like neon lights up there. Uh, if you see a meteorite, see a meteor in the sky, that's a piece of uh, an asteroid bringing silicon and oxygen to the Earth as a form of silicate minerals. And in fact, all of our minerals are brought to the Earth early on, on those dust particles, uh, silicon and oxygen again. And if you look down at that lake, you see that's hydrogen and oxygen. That was brought to the Earth by cometary infall about four and a half billion years ago. So all of the stuff around us, the whole Earth, is made of this dust with the organic compounds and the ice giving the water of life back about five billion years ago when the Earth began. So that's a new field now. It's called astrobiology. It's sort of a mixture of astronomy and biology. It's a weird new word. People have gotten used to it now in the sciences. NASA is putting $20 million a year into astrobiological research. And it's fun to look at the uh, definition of astrobiology. It's the evolutionary narrative of how stars give rise to life. And if you put that in a nutshell, this is what you're going to hear tonight. Hydrogen is a colorless, odorless gas that, when given enough time, changes into people. The proof is So how much time? The age of the universe. It's taken thir over 13 billion years to get this group of people in this room. Pretty amazing, isn't it? So that's the scope that we're going to go over in, in my talk tonight. Well, stars make elements from hydrogen. Uh, after millions to billions of years, they run out of gas. Our, our own sun will run out of gas about five billion years from now. And something happens when they run out of gas because they collapse in on themselves. The temperature goes up 100 million degrees. Unbelievable. Fusion reactions begin to produce heavier elements. Carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, so forth. The gold in my ring, if you're wearing gold jewelry, that was made in a fantastic explosion, such as we were going to see in the very next slide. Now watch this. 
Here is the Crab Nebula. It's a telescopic object. And about 1054 in the common era, Chinese <coughs> astronomers observed a new star in the sky. It lasted for a few uh, weeks, in fact. And this is the remains of that star. So this is stuff being blown away from that supernova explosion right there in the center is a little tiny star. You're going to hear that star in just a moment. And all of this, several light years across now. The uh, yellow is things like oxygen. The red is dust. Uh, this is the x-rays being given off, that bluish color. So really, all of this stuff coming out of that one star, and yet there's a hundred billion stars in our galaxy. And every one of them is finally going to the end of life. I'm going to turn that down just a bit. star that originally blew up. It's called a neutron star. It's rotating 30 times a second. It's giving off a radio beam. And every time that beam sweeps past the Earth, we hear it 30 times, a 30 hertz sound that you heard. That is a star talking to us. Our sun is going to look like this. It's not big enough to be a supernova, but at some point it's going to run out of gas. As I said, about 5 billion years from now. Here are some stars that already ran out of gas. We're the first generation of human beings ever to see the beauty that is surrounds us in our universe. If you're the very first astronomer to see it, you get to name it. <laughs> the Eskimo Nebula, because I suppose that kind of looks like an Eskimo cat's eye, a little bit different. But again, these are stars shedding all of those elements out into the rest of the interstellar space. And that gives rise to dust clouds like the Orion Nebula. There's some mysterious things out there. <laughs> this is real. This is a planetary nebula. It's called a star that sort of burped. And my daughter said, well, I know what that is. <laughs> and if you remember the Wizard of Oz and Glinda, the good witch of the East, so uh, she came to Oz on that beautiful bubble. So that's my daughter Stella, when she was about four or five. She saw that and figured it out. OK, that's what a dust particle looks like. This is a piece of interstellar dust. Every one of us is breathing in dust particles like that in every day of our lives because the Earth is accreting still. Stuff is still coming in at about 30,000 tons per year of new mass being added to the Earth as these little silicate dust particles. Uh, that's just a mineral, ordinary glassy mineral silicate. On the surface, however, is a thin coating of ice and uh, carbon compounds. So that, we think, is where some of the carbon compounds that gave rise to life first came from, by this infall of dust and meteorites and comets. So I'm going to tell you that story now. This is what it looks like. This is called the Goblin Nebula. I added the eyes, by the way. <laughs> Don't be spooked by that. But look at this. Here's another new start. This is what our sun looked like before it became a solar system. It starts in a cloud of dust and gas. The sun grabs some of that, starts its fusion engines, and then the surrounding <coughs> dust turns into planets. So that's really how it looks. This is some of the planet, uh, stars and planets now that we know have other solar systems around other stars. As I say, and uh, this is the Kepler survey, it's now well over uh, 2,000 uh, extrasolar planets. Some of them are really big, and uh, the, uh, re re really big planets. Some are kind of little down here. But if you look in each of those stars, every one of them has a little black dot. And that dot is a planet, and that's how we detect them. When the planet passes in front of the star, we see a little dip in the light. And if that dip comes by every few days to a few months to a few years, the astronomer can figure out that, in fact, that is a planet. Now, our sun, if we could look at it, is that size right there. That's our sun, and that's Jupiter passing in front of our sun. <coughs> Pretty neat, huh? It's just amazing that we're seeing all this stuff out there. And then once again, we are the first generation of human beings ever to realize how the universe is inhabited by other planets and other solar systems. OK, well, making the Earth it was a violent process. You're going to see how violent. Our planet and our moon was a collision between a Mars-sized object and the early Earth. 
And this is an artist's view of how that might have looked. So just imagine this thing coming in, and we're talking pretty fast speeds, even though at this scale, it might only look about some speed about like this, a little light coming in. And it grinds down into the earth, and it blows off a mass of the Earth's material and the, the Mars-sized object literally vaporizes, and the result of that is this. We're on the Earth looking toward our moon, which was much closer back then, and the moon is being made out of a ring of debris that was around the Earth. So these are volcanic temperatures, nothing alive. No organic compounds could survive these temperatures. You know, if lava goes down a hill in Hawaii, it just all turns to carbon dioxide. So it's too hot for anything organic to survive. So how did organic material get back to the Earth? So you see the moon was formed by the, by the, the, the ejection yes. product of, those, of the collisions? A glancing blow yeah. probably altered the rotation of the Earth. These are big objects, of course. And a splash of molten rock came into, the, into orbit around the Earth, and out of that, our moon accreted. So now the question is, how do we get water and organic material back to the Earth? Well, the Earth cools down pretty fast, in fact. It didn't take too long, a few tens of thousands of years. So here's the moon now, and this cratering record, the craters that we can see on the moon, <coughs> tell us that this is really what happened. You know, those craters had to come from someplace, and we now know that those craters are kind of leftover of this uh, process of uh, moon formation. Now, the Earth, on the other hand, remember, it was red hot just a few tens of thousands of years ago, but now it's cooled off enough for water to condense. And look, there is an impact. Over here, the artist has shown another impact. The Earth is accreting water <coughs> by cometary and meteoritic impacts. And along with that, as you'll see, comes organic carbon. Pretty amazing. This, by the way, is what a comet looks like. We've flown a NASA spacecraft very close to this particular comet. It's called Temple One, and that's the nucleus. Notice the impact craters, by the way. This comet itself has been bombarded by other smaller objects. I really don't know how big that is, but in the next slide, I have superimposed the skyline of New York. <laughs> that's how big the cometary nucleus is. It's about maybe a couple miles across, for instance. About 60% water, 30% mineral dust, and about 10% organic carbon. So even comets have organic carbon, and our ocean probably is about 10% comet water. And just imagine, 10%, that's about a kilometer, no, 10%, yeah, about a kilometer of uh, water. And imagine all the organic stuff that came in. So we don't have to depend on chemistry to make the organic compounds of life. We can just bring it here by extraterrestrial inflow. So this just summarizes what I told you. Dust particles have ice on them. The particles accrete into small objects like comets, planetesimals, <coughs> which are asteroids, in fact, they're leftover planetesimals. You have this late planetary or accretionary inflow, and that gives a dilute solution of organics in the prebiotic global ocean. So that's about the time that life can begin, when you finally have liquid water. Here's an artist's version of what the Earth was like four billion years ago, before life started. It was a volcanic Earth, something like Hawaii today. If you removed all the foliage on Hawaii, it would look something like this. This would be Mauna Loa or Mauna Kea. Notice that we have, uh, excuse me, we have uh, oceans, no doubt about that. They were probably salty. But since there was precipitation, we would have freshwater ponds as well. So we're not stuck with a marine origin of life. We can also have a freshwater origin. And I think that's more likely myself. So it's four billion years ago. And uh, what organic compounds do we need to crank up life? We've got to have monomers. Now monomers are things like amino acids that you can link together into a polymer, like a protein. So when I look out at this little bunch of bodies out here, I see protein, of course. And if I took that protein and hydrolyzed it, I get amino acids, about 20 amino acids back. So you've got to have a source of amino acids to start up life. You also have to have what we call nucleobases. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil are what life uses today for ribonucleic acid. Four bases. And uh, if you change uh, uracil into thymine, that's DNA. The four bases uh, of DNA are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. 
Then you need carbohydrates to link them together and phosphate, very important. You also need compounds that produce cellular compartments, and that's where soap bubbles come in, because what we've done is to extract pieces of an asteroid that fall to Earth as meteorites. So here's an asteroid called Eros. And notice the craters, all those craters there. Those are impact craters from smaller asteroids hitting. Every time that happens, meteorites are produced. Those, if they come to the Earth, would be what we can go out and pick up and find meteorites. And we've actually caught, just by accident, a collision in the asteroid belt. They saw this, they thought it was a new comet, but it wasn't. It's got a little bitty asteroid right there. All of this stuff is potential meteorites. If they get to the Earth, they would be meteorites, just what you see in museums and so forth. Well, I'm going to show you one meteorite. It looks like this. This is the Murchison meteorite over Australia in 1969. Now, this is a little bit of photoshopping here, I confess. This is a real fireball that they caught by accident. This is a real Australian landscape down here. But I just wanted to show you what it looked, what it looked like in 1969 when people saw a flash of light. They look up, it's a bird, it's a plane. No, it's a meteorite. But sure enough, it explodes and scatters meteorites all over the little town in Murchison, Australia. Every one of those little red spots is about a boulder-sized chunk of this. And by boulder, I'm talking about small boulders, you know, chunks like this that are picked up, maybe 100 kilograms total. So we've got some of that in my lab. This is uh, one of ours that so we've had. We had three pieces of Murchison come through my lab. See, it still had a fusion crust because it's going pretty fast, and the surface of it ablates, just like the space shuttle coming in, you know. It gets red hot. Well, that happens to these meteorites, too. If you break it open, you can see that, in fact, there are internal structures. These are called chondrites. They're sort of basically little quartz-like things. We understand where they came from. And if you look at the black stuff, you discover that it's about 2% organic compounds, one of which is like coal. We call that kerogen. And about uh, maybe 5% of all of that is, in fact, soluble organics. And if you look at that, that's what is in there. It's a veritable chemical laboratory of stuff. Amino acids, amides, hydrocarbons, that's oils and stuff, aldehydes, alcohols, even purines like adenine, one of the bases of DNA, is in there. I'm going to let you, for the first time in your life, smell. So when I uh, take my wine glass back east, they say, geez, what's that wine glass for? Here in California, they say, oh, yeah, he brought a wine glass. Look, you know, maybe there's going to be some wine at the end of my car. Right. I'm going to pour a little bit of meteorite extract in, and I'm going to ask Piero to smell it and tell me what you smell, and then we can pass it around. You're going to smell something that is 5 billion years old, at least. in chloroform, so we don't want to smell it yet. <laughs> okay, I can see it. Yeah, there it is. Mm, I love that smell. Tell me what you smell now. Or describe it. Yeah, you should see his face. What do you get out of that? It's very strong. Oh, it's strong, right. Other people say dirty socks. Uh -huh. The contents of a vacuum cleaner bag, an old cigar butt. So see what you smell. And let me warn you that the, this has the same kinds of compounds in the cigarette smoke is. So if you don't like cigarette smoke, don't smell this. It's got polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. But I've been smelling it for years, and as far as I can tell, I'm doing okay. <laughs> okay, let's uh, finish up here. So there's a little close-up of the interior of one of our meteorite samples. What we found is that if you extract that meteorite <coughs> just as I'm passing around with this wine glass, it'll form membranes. There is stuff in the meteorite extract that makes cell-like membranes. And I saw this under the microscope for the first time in 1985. Couldn't believe my eyes that uh, here this has never been alive, but it makes these little microscopic soap bubbles. And we know that it's a true bubble because it can encapsulate a fluorescent dye, you can sort of see it captured here. So these are the same kind of uh, material. Pretty amazing that it's so easy to make little cell-like structures. So let's take a little bit further. What is required to start up life? You've got to have nucleic acid, 
You've got to have proteins, and you've got to have a compartment, just what I showed you a moment ago. If we have all of that, it self-assembles. And you're watching lipid, phospholipid, self-assemble into some of those little structures. And uh, it, this is what it looks like under the microscope. A little bit uh, faster. I put in the jazz myself. <laughs> the jazz is uh, self-assembly of musical notes. Here you see self-assembly of molecules. the DNA and make what we call protocells. So that the rest of the material inside is in fact DNA captured in those little lipid vesicles. And that's how we think life began. There had to be a membrane, there had to be polymers, the polymers had to be functional. We think we know how to make that start to happen. And then as soon as they begin to grow and reproduce, we have the origin of life. So I think I got done in about 20 minutes. Not bad, huh? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Awesome.